Hi, I'm Sean Cantwell, and this is the new Scaling Success Podcast. We started Scaling Success to provide a space for entrepreneurs and business leaders to discuss the important topics that contribute to building a valuable and long-lasting enterprise, and to juxtapose our view as investors with that of entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs who are on the front lines. Episodes are now on Spotify. We are thrilled to welcome our very distinguished guest, J.D. Sherman, to the podcast today. J.D. is the CEO of Dashlane, a B2B and B2C cross-platform subscription-based password manager. Prior to Dashlane, J.D. was the president and chief operating officer for HubSpot, where he worked from 2012 to 2020. JD helped lead the company through its IPO in 2014, as well as its post IPO growth, reaching almost 4,000 employees and 900 million of revenue. Prior to HubSpot, JD spent six years as Akamai's chief financial officer and also served in senior financial executive role at IBM. JD currently serves on the board of directors of Citrix in addition to his role at Dashlane. JD is a graduate of Emory University, Go Eagles, and University of Chicago School of Business. JD resides in the greater Boston area and is a member of Volition Capital's advisory board. JD, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much. By the way, you didn't say Go Maroons for the uh, for University of Chicago. <laughs> you know, I, I pride myself on my knowledge of college mascots, yeah. but I reached my limit at University of Chicago. Yeah, well, you know, they don't really have they have they have a Division three team. They used to play. You know, Jay Berwanger, the first Heisman Trophy winner, was from the University of Chicago. That's right, University of Chicago. I'm a Notre Dame grad, as as you know. And yeah. back in the day, that was a big rivalry back in the tens and twenties. Yeah, I remember some of those games. <laughs> <laughs> So I just gave about a 10 minute intro on your background, JD. You have accomplished a lot uh, during the course of your career. I did a little internet sleuthing in advance of this conversation. And in addition to everything I mentioned, I learned that you're a big LSU fan. So maybe give us a little bit more color on, on your background and you know, kind of your, your upbringing and path to your role as uh, an established and esteemed tech executive. Okay, well, so I did. I I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That explains the LSU. My best friend, as a as a little kid's father, was uh, one of the coaches on the LSU staff. So we got to go into the stadium, meet the players, walk around on the sideline, and you know, ever since then, I've just been a huge LSU fan. But I did go away to college. I went north to college, as you said, to Atlanta, to uh, to Emory University, uh, and <clears throat> then on to the University of Chicago, and. My first job ever was actually in Burlington, Vermont. So kind of anchored me and I met my wife up there. And so we have kind of been anchored in, in New England, although we've moved around a lot since then. All right, great. You big Coach O guy? Big Coach O guy. We finally have a coach that doesn't have an accent. You know? Yeah, so right. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard it put that way. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing that jumps out about your background, JD, you know, and, and I listed some of your prior prior stops, is that you have a lot of marquee logos in your bio. And I don't even know if they were necessarily marquee logos, some of them when, when you joined, but nevertheless, you know, I'm, I'm curious to kind of kind of hear your thoughts about how you've navigated kind of your career path and how you considered and, and kind of weighed different opportunities as they presented themselves. Yeah, I think a lot of that was happenstance. Like certainly when I joined HubSpot, you know, it was it was a well-known startup, but it wasn't necessarily a marquee logo. Um, but I would say, you know, one of the things that the pieces of advice I give people is like, don't go searching for that title. You know, you don't need to be chief executive officer of some, you know, a company that's not growing or not scaling or you're not going to learn. It's really like, where can you learn? And I tell you, I spent the first 15 years at IBM, uh, as you mentioned, and I just learned a ton. It was a great place to learn. You know, it wasn't all wine and roses, obviously. I joined right before uh, Lou Gerstner did, and he came in and sort of had to really right the ship. So, you know, but you learn from those types of experiences. You learn a lot from uh, scaling and change. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned your 15 years at IBM, and I think of IBM as uh, kind of the poster child for big company, Mm -hmm. big company culture, thousands of employees, international. 
you moved on to Akamai, also a large company. Mm-hmm. You know, then you kind of entered startup world, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're, you're one of these folks that's been successful in a big company and a small company. And I'm, I'm curious, given your vantage point, I'd love to hear your perspective on kind of the reality of that. People often like to label executives yeah. as a big company executive or a startup executive. You've seen both. And I'm just curious to kind of get your perspective. Yeah. Well, they're they're quite different. I will tell you. I was, you know, in fact, when I left uh, IBM for Akamai, obviously IBM was four hundred thousand employees. Akamai at the time was about five hundred, so it was quite it's quite a small, <clears throat> quite a change. Um, but you know, so it was sort of a ratchet down. And then the way I thought about Akamai at the time was it's in a scale up mode, and a lot of what I learned about what it means to manage at a larger scale at IBM was going to apply at Akamai, but you can't just simply bring in, you know, the big company playbook to a growing scaling company. Um, and so I took a lot of those lessons to, to Akamai. When I left Akamai, we were a billion dollars and probably 3,000, 4,000 employees. Then I went to, to HubSpot, where it was 200, and it was sort of a similar, similar move. It was like, we learned a lot about scaling and growing fast at, at Akamai that I knew was going to apply to HubSpot. But early on, the most important thing was make sure that you don't break the culture, make sure that you don't um, jerk the steering wheel too much towards conventional wisdom. In fact, Brian, the co-founder, CEO of my boss, you know, after I was there about 90 days, he drew on a whiteboard, a, a continuum. On one side, it was like conventional wisdom. And on the other side, it was transformational thinking, or I forget what the second word was. And he said, I'm really, really worried that you're going to pull us too far this way. And I think that was probably a good awakening for me that I, you know, that would have been my natural tendency. And I had to sort of compensate for that and make sure that we were doing the things that worked for HubSpot and not for Akamai or IBM. That's really interesting. I, I'd love to dig a little deeper on that because as I understand it, you, you know, you were one of the earlier kind of senior external executive hires mm-hmm. in the HubSpot, yeah. a very entrepreneurial, high growth venture funded business. Um, and I'm curious kind of how you navigated that and how you managed to find the balance where you're bringing to the table a lot of your strengths yeah. and, and probably complementing the existing team while also mm-hmm. having to, to kind of recognize and, and, and pay the proper respect to that entrepreneurial yeah. spirit. I think that there was also a balance like HubSpot, the company and Brian and Darmesh, the founders, they also recognized that HubSpot was about to enter a new stage that was kind of uncharted ground. And uh, they, you know, they needed help to figure out what, how, to, how to sort of layer in what I call an operating system to really scale. Um, and so when they were talking to people, they frankly were you know, looking for somebody that had that, but they were also looking for somebody who you know, wouldn't just like force a playbook, wouldn't come in with a you know, sort of a, this is how you do it, a, a rote type situation. And so that's sort of what we did at HubSpot. We, we looked at what worked for the company and made sense. And then we also over time sort of, you know, kind of had operating system version 1.0, version 2.0, based on where we needed to be. And my observation was always, like, I would rather run when you're a growing company, and there's a huge market opportunity, I would rather run a little loose than a little too tight, you know, to use that, you know, an auto racing, you know, metaphor. So we always tried to, like, I always thought about that, sort of the systems and practices we had in place, we want to be really data driven, so we can see what's happening. But we don't want to put too tight of controls on the business be, that would to tend to slow us down. We would err on the side of making mistakes and recovering quickly. Mm-hmm. So as you know, the stage where we tend to partner with companies and entrepreneurs is that point where you know, product market fit has been established. You got a broad base of referenceable customers. And the entrepreneurs are really focused on putting the pieces in place to scale aggressively. Yeah. And I'm curious, just based on your experience at a number of stops, you know, what advice do you pro- provide entrepreneurs when they ask that question? Sure. JD, like, I'm ready to get aggressive. Yeah. I want to do it in the right way. What are the types of things I should be thinking about and considering, yeah. uh, you know, really balancing that opportunity against, you know, some of the risks that will likely present themselves? Yeah. Well, I think the, my advice is usually, to, to think about repeatable mechanisms. And that's very different than process, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Like process means, you know, I'm gonna have new ways that I'm gonna review things and budgets and forecasts and things like that. 
obviously as you grow and you eventually have to be Sarbanes-Oxley compliant, all that stuff, you have to do that. But it's really the mechanisms that are going to be helpful to you and, and that you can teach to an organization. You can ingrain an organization's culture and they're repeatable, whether it's like how you onboard a customer. Uh, you know, obviously your, your, um, your uh, sales acquisition funnel, like that needs to become repeatable, whereas before it wasn't, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of like hone in on what's going to be repeatable and uh, that you can ingrain in how everybody thinks about the, the problem, because then you're going to be able to scale. Not only are you going to be able to find market product market fit, but you're going to be able to really scale because you don't have to do it all yourself. You don't have to handhold every customer. You don't have to, um, you know, personally be involved in every aspect of product management, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's almost like establishing the baseline of what success looks like so that you can repeat it over mm -hmm. and over and trying to bring some order to the chaos that often exists in a high growth company environment. That's exactly right. Because the, the tendency is to put processes in place that takes away sort of autonomy and uh, experimentation. Um, and you have to sort of fight against that, that urge a little bit. On the other hand, you know, things have to, you start to have to do things in a, a scalable economical way. And so right. that's why I, I think the word mechanism, which we, which I got from, uh, from Jeff Bezos, actually, he talks about mechanisms all the time. That's just magic, really. If you think about that, it's like, what is the, you know, what is the sort of uh, mousetrap we're going to create that every time this situation comes up, we know we can rely on? Yep. And I'm curious, you know, in some of the organizations you've entered and, and you might even be experiencing this all over again. Um, you know, I've worked with a CEO before who likes to say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, which mm -hmm. I appreciate. And I yeah. agree with that. And I echo yeah. that uh, to a lot of CEOs that are really looking to kind of uh, aggressively scale up. And, and I'm just curious, you know, from your standpoint, you know, what are some examples of mechanisms you put in place Mm -hmm. to kind of help companies, you know, kind of measure and manage yeah. output and hopefully start to establish some repeatability. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's sort of, uh, it's an incremental process. And what, what I mean by that is like, when we, when we were at HubSpot, you know, we were going hundred miles an hour and then one month, something would really break mm -hmm. like, holy crap. You know, we just totally missed the sales month and we, we should have seen it coming. And then, so the way we would do is we'd say, why didn't we see it coming? What was the piece of data that would have been interesting to us that would have helped us see it coming and avoid it. And then we would add that piece of data to the sort of stuff we looked at all the time. And so, you know, you start out and, you know, when I first got there, we were pretty loose. Like we, a great example was like, we obviously were generating lots and lots of leads, but we didn't know exactly. We weren't really paying too close attention to what the, what, how good the quality of the leads were, what their sources were and, things like that. And so all of a sudden the leads were growing, but sales were flattening out. And we're like, what's going on? What would help us understand that? And so we, we clicked through that and we sort of got to the next level of the way we managed our demand funnel. You know, those are the kind of things that you do. And then every once in a while, you end up with a, a management deck that's like three inches thick and you have to go back and refactor it and say, this is sort of ingrained. We have the mechanisms for this now. We don't even need to look at this anymore. And that allows you to go and think about what, what's next in your business that you have to sort of make it ingrained in your culture and ingrained in the way you do business. That's great. I think today, you know, for entrepreneurs that want to build and scale a SaaS business, there's a lot of information out there. And yeah. you can almost like download, hey, here are some metrics and key dashboards I should use yeah. to help manage the business and know which levers to pull. Yeah. HubSpot was kind of, you know, one of the early leaders, right? And I'm yeah. sure in your role, there wasn't necessarily like, you know, a Google search, how to, how to manage the yeah. finances <laughs> of a SaaS business. I'm, I'm curious how you went, that pro went through that process of really understanding mm -hmm. what are the key priorities to drive shareholder value yeah. and then how you kind of translated that, you know, throughout the business. That's a great question. I always say that if I really understood SaaS economics, I never would have joined HubSpot. <laughs> because when you know when we finally figured out how to measure the, a business like you know we had our churn was way too high that's the most obvious thing for any SaaS business you yep. have attention to and you know I can I can talk about that in more detail but it is true back in 2012 it was a relatively new thing even in 2014 when we were on the road pitching our IPO we were having to explain to some pretty savvy investors how a SaaS model worked and, and right. 
I don't think that's the case anymore. So there's a, there are a lot of resources out there that SaaS companies can lean on. We were lucky because we had uh, Sequoia as a board member and they had a ton of uh, experience about that. And we had David Scott from Matrix was one of our board members and he's kind of a SaaS you know, uh, expert on this. He's one of those folks that publishes a lot of material online. And and a lot of it, like he learned alongside of us and are taught alongside of us, like as we developed our methodologies and everything. And it was super, super value, valuable for that. The one lesson that I, I learned, frankly, the hard way a couple of times is, uh, you know, you obviously look at your lifetime value of a customer and your CAC, um, and, uh, you know, there are, the, the thing that you have to be careful about with those is they sound like leading indicators, but they're, you're measuring them based on the data that you have now. So they're almost kind of lagging indicators. Mm-hmm. You've got to figure out a way to measure customer success and customer happiness. And so we did a bunch of different things from the complex to the, to the simple, like the simple measure NPS. I highly recommend that you're always asking your customers about net promoters, you know, how they feel about your product and measuring that. The complex, we started as we got more uh, clever with the data and got more data, was figuring out when a customer acts this way, you know, they behave this way in terms of, a, uh, you know, their future as a customer and, you know, building a mechanism to sort of get that ingrained in the way you do everything from build the product to onboard a customer to, uh, you know, deal with their renewals to everything. You know, we created like a, a one single number score that tells us the sort of a health check for our customers that worked until it didn't. And then we went on and kept, you know, kept iterating on that. But, you know, I think the thing that you have to be super careful of as you scale, particularly as a founder or whatever, is you have to fight to stay really close to the customer and and get ways, get mechanisms to understand the feedback you're getting from your customers. Yeah. Just to pick on one point you mentioned, uh, I think you said when you were looking to join HubSpot, if you had known as much as, as you know yeah. now, maybe you wouldn't have joined. And one of those points w- was kind of churn. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a topic every SaaS business obviously wants to have the highest retention possible. Yeah. And I think when any company sets out to build its three-year forecast, they're showing improvements in that retention over time. I will yeah. say just from my vantage point as an investor, yeah, it's easy to put it on a spreadsheet. It's really hard to actually improve that over time. And I'm curious, it sounds like at HubSpot, you guys were able to kind of put mechanisms, to use your word, in place to really improve retention. And and I'm curious if you can, you know, provide our listeners with some examples of things you guys did to really move the needle on that front. Well, sure. Well, the one thing is like you tend to want to, you tend to want to find the silver bullet on retention, like, oh, it's a product problem or, oh, pricing or something like that. Very rarely, maybe it is sometimes, but very rarely, if not never, is it just one thing. And what we had to do at HubSpot was we kind of said like, okay, there are like seven or eight aspects of our business. There's sales, there's marketing, there's customer success, there's product, there's engineering and everything. Like everybody, what we're going to focus on is our number one priority is customer retention, right? And so then you have to think about it differently. Like, like if I just put 100% of my effort on, on customer retention, what would I do differently as a sales organization? So as an example there, what we said was, wow, a sales team is signing up customers that are not necessarily great fits for the product. Um, you know, they don't even have a website, for example, <laughs> in some bad case, like you're not going to have much success with HubSpot if you don't have a website. Um, and so we changed the way we compensated sales reps so that they were uh, c- compensated better when the customers had great retention. That was a simple one. You know, the leads, I talked a little bit about the lead scoring, like we, we, we figured out how to qualify leads based on lifetime, projected lifetime value versus likelihood to close. The, uh, the onboarding, we actually required customers to, to buy onboarding, which is obviously adding a lot of friction in the, the process. We changed our pricing to have a second tier so that you can, so that customers who did stick around would grow with us as their business grew. Um, so it's like every, everything that, you know, every part of the business had to improve for us to get that, that done. So I, I would just say like, if churn is your problem, get up, get on a whiteboard, write down every aspect of your business and write down what that, what that business, what that part of the business would do differently if their number one goal was uh, reducing churn. And by the way, that's a pretty good number one goal. Cause that's also like customer happiness, perfectly hundred percent correlated. 
So JD, across you know your stops, you've seen success in a number of different places. And, and one of the questions I get asked a lot by entrepreneurs thinking about raising money is, you know, they'll kind of go through the volition portfolio and say, hey, what did those really successful companies have in common? Mm-hmm. And I'm curious from, from kind of your steps, if you're able to kind of draw out any commonalities from your different stops that, that you think were really key contributors to, yeah. to driving a successful outcome. That's a great question, actually. Um, I should probably give it more thought. As I think about it, there's sort of like one sort of super high level commonality and then maybe a couple of, uh, of smaller ones. The super high level one is like, you can rally the company around the mission that you're, that you're after. I've seen that not only in the companies that I've been a part, lucky, lucky enough to be a part of, but the ones who are super successful. They generally, like if you went around and talked to every employee, they would understand what the mission is. It's like, mm-hmm. it's hard to believe that that really matters, but it really matters. Like everybody, you know, we're mission driven human beings these days. And I think if you can get people to rally around that, uh, that makes, that makes a difference. I think the smaller ones are like, you know, the ones that really talk about customers and measure customer success and everything, they tend to do better than the ones who sort of let that drift away. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, Akamai was a great company, great example of that. I think we kind of drifted a little bit away from that. There were some, you know, we kind of got led by our very biggest customers and that might've been a little bit of a, of a mistake. Obviously Akamai has done, had great success, but like I, I fault myself as the CFO for pushing the company like away from that thought process a little bit. So I think that's a big one. Um, and I think it's also just discipline. It's like, you know, there's some companies, it's like, uh, what's a great, like a sports analogy is like some teams, they have tough years, but they still like eat their way to the playoffs, mm-hmm. you know, just because even things get tough, they like bear down and they get it done. And some teams like totally blow up. Like you just have to have grit as a company, I think. Yep. I mean, I think a lot of the comments you just made kind of tie back to culture and culture is one of those things I'm sure you think about now in your role as, as CEO at, at Dashlane and culture is one of those things that's like hard to define. I'm curious how you think about culture, you know, perhaps in part reflecting back on, you know, kind of past experiences, but also, you know, kind of your current role. How do you think about building culture that's really aligned around a mission that kind of ties people together. It's interesting because I just went through the exercise with my new team at Dashlane to sort of re, relaunch our values and our culture. And as we talked about it as a team, we kind of borrowed uh, the analogy that we used at HubSpot, which is culture is like a product in so many ways. So, you know, think about the ways are. So it has features. The features are like the values that you that you establish as a company and say, we are going to do this and we're not going to do this kind of stuff, right? It's kind of open source. Like everybody, uh, you know, commits, <laughs> everybody adds to it and uh, impacts it and stuff like that. And so you have to be thoughtful about, you know, all the hiring you do, all of the coaching and the way you do performance management, all that stuff that has to, to, to play there. And every once in a while, it needs to be refactored because you change a lot as a company. Like one of the things that like HubSpot had a thing, I think a fantastic culture because we spent a lot of time on it. We wrote it down. That's really important. And then we, we wrote it down in an aspirational way rather than trying to codify the current state. Um, but the fact is like HubSpot is very different than when I joined and it was 200 people. You know, the executive team are early on were mostly startup folks and some it, it was time for them to move on. And they knew it because it's not, not their deal. Um, and now it's, you know, a, a 5,000 person company with uh, you know, a totally different thing, but the, un- the underlying culture has to stay the same, but you have to sort of continually refactor it. That's great. You know, and I'm, I'm sure culture is, is one of those things that's a top priority item for all CEOs. I think mm-hmm. another question we get a lot at Volition from entrepreneurs who are thinking about raising capital and they want to help position their company to kind of achieve new heights. They'll ask you a question like, what do you think are the key roles of a CEO? Mm-hmm. And how do you define a good and successful CEO? I'm curious to get your perspective, because as I kind of trace your career history, 
to use a, a sports analogy, you're, you're kind of the five tool pet player. You know, <laughs> you like came up through finance that I think at various points in your career, you had responsibility over just about every functional area in the organization, which I'm sure uh, in no small part has informed your view mm-hmm. on what a good and effective CEO is. So yeah. I'm just curious, how would you answer that question? Well, it is funny because I, you know, the progression for me when, you know, when you're a CFO or in finance, you think, eh, I could run this place. Like, how hard could that be, right? You know, yep. I have all the numbers. I, I'm a business guy. I yep. can run this operating officer. And to really sort of own the number, if you will, like have to have to actually, uh, you know, make things happen. It was a huge leap. And you had to learn a lot about that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I got my feet underneath me. And I'm like, yeah, you know, CEO, how much harder can that be? Like, um, you know, whatever. It is another huge leap to, to be the CEO because not only do you now have to sort of, uh, keep an eye on how things are running, but you have to set the vision and the culture for the company. There's like, uh, you know, there's a lot riding on that on your shoulders. And um, some people are, it's very rare to find somebody who's really good at sort of that aspect, as well as the operational aspect. I think, you know, that's probably why Brian brought me in at uh, at HubSpot is he he wanted to focus more on the, the vision and the ex, external and the strategy and the culture. And, and lean on somebody like that. And that's probably my skill set. As I think about it as a CEO, obviously I have to develop that, but you, I, my, what I would say to CEOs is like, figure out where your blind spots are. And one, you have to over-index on them a little bit, but secondly, you got to ask yourself, is, is your team well positioned to sort of fill in the blind spots for you? You know, I think about my role as a, as a CEO and even as a COO, you know, I'm not really a product person. I didn't grow up in engineering or product. I grew up in finance. Um, uh, So I have to make sure that I have a really strong uh, product team. And I'm testing when I'm talking with my product team as much about like customer needs and are are they doing that as, as, you know, even more so about how they're, what they're thinking, what their thought process is. Is it, is it working? Can I count on this team to sort of deliver for us? Yep. I mean, one area that is probably more in your comfort zone, just given your finance background, is just capital allocation yeah. and how to think about the budget. And, you know, another question that I'm sure you get from entrepreneurs is when should I raise money? Yeah. And how should I think about that? What are the pros and potential cons of, of mm-hmm. raising raising capital? Yeah. Well, there are definitely cons. Like uh, it never fails. You guys have probably seen this as much as anybody. It, ne- it never fails when a company does a big raise for a short period of time, they kind of go sideways. You know, <laughs> uh, it happened at HubSpot when we did that. It happened at Dashlane uh, when, you know, and I've seen it so, so much in any company because. No, everyone's focused on buying the uh, logoed Patagonia vests. Yeah, you know? that's probably what it is. It's certainly distracting, but it also, it, it may tend to make you lose focus. And so I, I joked like uh, if I were going to raise a hundred million dollars, um, I would put, I would put 75 million of it in a certificate of deposit that I couldn't touch for two years because, you know, you just have to be careful that you don't lose focus now that we're so well capitalized. Are we still driving, uh, for what we want? So like the question I always ask is like, well, what's the catalyst you're trying to, uh, ignite here mm-hmm. with this? Is it, uh, is it that, oh, I, now I need to, you know, turn on the hiring because I've got my, my funnel is like way too efficient. I need to start pouring gas on that. Or now I need to like double down on, on the engine, you know, engineering and like how much money do you really need for that to drive that catalyst? Like what is the, what is the thing that's going to, going to drive you there? That's great. And you know, when you raise money, then all of a sudden you have a board. Yeah. Got a report too. Yeah, that's and right. there are folks that have expectations about financial performance. Sometimes the companies we invest in, uh, they've never had a board before mm-hmm. until they mm-hmm. they choose to raise money. Yeah. And you know, I'm curious, just given given your experience as both an executive and as an independent board member, mm-hmm. I think it'd be helpful. Maybe like demystify for our listeners a little bit. Yeah, the board of directors. What is its role? Yeah, um, and what does a good, high functioning board look like? And, and, and kind of how can they help advance the cause of, of the business? That's a great, that's a great question. Actually, I've seen, you know, company like executive teams that get a little bit intimidated by their board. 
because like if you've raised money, you're raising money from all these fancy investors like you guys at Volition and other people. Super and fancy. Super successful. And, you know, like yeah, that when a board says, you know, boo, everybody's like, oh, man, I ought to be scared because that this is like the advice. So I think you had to be, you know, the, the relationship you have to establish with the board is a little bit more different. And I wouldn't say advisory might be a good word, but the other thing I would say is like, I've, I've obviously dealt with, uh, you know, VC led boards and small company startup growth company boards. And I've been on public company boards and it's very, very different. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about the early stage startup boards, you're basically, you're hiring, you're putting people on your board that are going to be consultative and advisory to you. Like you're, you're going to ask them if you do it right, in my opinion, to be willing to roll up their sleeves with you and solve some problems that you're trying to get your arms around. And there, that's how a board is super valuable. You know, in fact, one way you, you, I'm sure you guys would agree, you pick your investors a little bit based on their ability to help you uh, achieve that. It starts to change a little bit when you get to a public company where boards are more about, I would say, guidance and guardrails. It's like, sure, the board has lots of experiences, but, you know, they're not going to help you run the day-to-day -day operations for the most part. They're going to help you understand if you're getting really close to some guardrails that are dangerous and maybe give you some guidance. So, but for, you know, the kind of companies that, that you guys are investing in and, and that, I would say what you want is to establish a relationship of, you know, where you trust the board enough where you can say, here's a problem I'm dealing with. Can you come in and help me do that? And then also that relationship has to be trusting enough to say, hey, I appreciate it. I don't think that's what we're going to do. We're going to go the other way here. I've listened to what you said and we're going the other way. We did that many, many times at, at the HubSpot board and the board members were appreciative and helpful. And they also you know, would buy in on it when we did. They would disagree and commit to, get to, to steal another one from Jeff Bezos and Amazon. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, as someone who sits on the board of a, a bunch of companies we invest in, you always want to have that back and forth. And just because a question is being asked, that's yeah. not a statement of fact. And, totally. and you know, I, I think most investors welcome the pushback because yeah. the executives are the ones on the rock face close to the issues and problems. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the they know. Yeah. The red flag for me with an executive is if they're defensive. Yep. You know, that's a red flag. And as a board member there, I try to pull that executive aside and say, do you think we're not on the same team here? Do you think we're not trying to get to the same good result? Uh, if so, then we should talk about that because that's a sort of a fundamental issue. But I think we are, and therefore there's no need to be defensive here. There's like a need to be collaborative. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I think right now we're in this unique window of time where there are a lot of companies going public. Yeah. So, I mean, I can tell you for, you know, 20 years of being in this business, I think the conversations around, hey, should we consider an IPO or a SPAC um, are just happening with much higher frequency. Um, yeah. And as a result, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there really trying to understand what does it mean to be a public company? You've been right there on the front yeah. lines at a few <laughs> public companies, both as an executive yeah. uh, and, and as a board member. And what advice would you provide for entrepreneurs who are, you know, considering a public offering sure. amongst perhaps other options, you know, yeah. when do you think it makes sense versus not? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of, of uh, sort of, nor, you know, conventional wisdom around that. And it's mostly correct about, you know, the way to think about public versus raise and everything. But a couple of observations I have on it, though. First of all, like I said before, I always thought about like, when do you fundraise? Like, what's the catalyst you're looking for? Well, a public raise can be a catalyst. It can really be a tailwind for your business, um, just being in the public market and in the public eye. It, it, you know, it certainly we saw that and felt it at HubSpot. Um, and so from that standpoint, that was an intangible of, you, of doing our basically Series E as a, as a public IPO, you mm -hmm. know, the way we, we thought about that. Um, I would think, and, uh, you know, I wasn't at uh, Akamai when it went public for, you know, back in the dot-com days when there was, it had really no business being a public company um, at the time. I think there probably is a stage at which it's too early for your company to go public and it's going to be dangerous and damaging to the way you want to run the company, because there is quite a bit of sort of uh, necessary overhead of being a public company, because you have to you know, you have a responsibility to your investors and as a public, as a private company, it's easily manageable because your investors fit in the same room. 
Uh, whereas it's different when you're a public company and they all have, uh, you know, the, the way you communicate with them is in earnings calls and 10 Ks and 10 Qs and everything. So there's definitely a responsibility to investors. You have to ask yourself, am I ready to, uh, am I ready to take that on or is it going to be damaging to the company? You know, at HubSpot, we waited as long as we possibly could, honestly. You know, when we went public, we had literally zero dollar, zero net dollars on our, our books and we were, we were into our line of credit because we wanted to make sure we were ready to, de- to be a, a mature public company. And then we, we also wanted to make sure that we had set it up so that the company wouldn't feel differently to our employees when, we, you know, we still had that sort of those mechanisms that I talked about, they would still work. Our culture wouldn't be damaged, that, that kind of thing. That's great. There's a lot of wisdom in, in those words and, and, you know, kind of hearing your perspective. So what's, what's next for J.D. Sherman, your CEO at Dashlane right now? Maybe tell our listeners a little bit, um, you know, about the company, its offerings. I know password protection is probably relevant for everyone yeah. to some degree. So we'd love to, to hear a little bit more about the business and, yeah. and what you're hoping to accomplish. Well, I think it's a really interesting business. It started, uh, Dashlane started as a password manager for consumers, as many of the password managers did. So it was, you download it onto your laptop or you download it onto your your phone and it it helps you manage uh, all the passwords that, you know, normal human behavior, you write them down and you're not careful with them. And it does it in a way that, you know, it makes your life easier. It kind of solves some of the, the headaches of every time you're logging in and things like that. Super interesting business. Our observation is there's a huge opportunity for password management on the B2B side. If you think about the cybersecurity problem, you have all these uh, tools and technology that people bring to bear, whether it's firewalls or intrusion detection or endpoint management, all this kind of stuff, you know, building walls around your your infrastructure. Well, there's a big gate and it's your employees and Mm -hmm. their employees are only human and they're going to do silly things. And, uh, you know, 80, 90 percent of uh, uh, breaches of your your data infrastructure at, happen through that gate through bad password management and everything. So if we can bring if we can make a password manager that's easy to use, easy to buy, easy to deploy, get your uh, employees using it and 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 you know not behaving like they are tending to behave as as sloppy human beings, which you can't blame them for. Then I think we really kind of close the loop on on cybersecurity for, uh, for, for companies. And that's really, I think, a big opportunity for Dashlane and what we're, we're focused on. Yeah, no, I think there's like an education component. I saw a tweet uh, you sent out about you're an LSU fan and you thought LSU would be too simple. So yes, it was L-S-U exactly. <laughs> spelled, yep. spelled out as a password. <laughs> I think we can all relate to that on some okay. level. So I think, I think uh, putting tools in the hands of your employees to maybe yeah, yeah. be a little bit more uh, responsible and careful, careful with with passwords is just good business sense. Oh yeah, definitely is. Well, JD, thank you so much. We covered a range of topics today. I know our listeners uh, have a lot to gain and benefit from just in terms of hearing your experiences on a broad range of topics that I often get asked about. So uh, I know I know folks will will really enjoy listening to this and, and learning from your experiences. So thank you so much for for joining us today. Great. That was was my pleasure. Thanks so much, J.D. Take care. Take care.